So uh, our research addressed four primary questions uh, that you see here. Uh, first of all, who are the caregivers and how did they assume their roles? How do formal services factor into the world of caregivers? How are caregivers supported and what do their networks of informal support look like? And what can be done to build and strengthen effective support networks for caregivers? And this is what Kirsten was just focusing on. She really wants to take away from today, and I'll ask you to focus on this again later, we, we really want to take away from today ideas about how we can strengthen these informal networks. Um, our survey was concentrated in a series of St. Paul neighborhoods, uh, the ones that are uh, the darker outlines in the, uh, um, uh, the figure up on the screen. Uh, we did in-depth interviews with 212 caregivers, uh, and uh, we deliberately used quotas. Uh, we wanted about two-thirds of our sample to be primary caregivers and one-third of our sample to be secondary caregivers. We had to screen literally thousands of calls, uh, thousands of uh, um, random calls to household addresses in these uh, block areas in order to find the caregivers. Uh, however, the response rate was high once people identified themselves as a caregiver. Um, the information uh, that's presented here will focus in large part on those primary caregivers, but we'll also have a little bit to say about the secondary caregivers. Typically, uh, caregivers that we spoke with were age 57, uh, that's the midpoint, but uh, older adults uh, that they were caring for were typically age 80. The caregivers in this sample were diverse. Um, there were perhaps a few more men than we expected. 30% uh, were men, 69% were women. I think it's well known uh, among those that are here that uh, caregiving uh, typically falls to women. 25% of people of color were in the sample. Uh, they were relatively small distributions with Asian, Latino, and African American folks. Um, but uh, we are not going to unpack much of that data today. The sample is relatively small in each of those groups, but there is some more qualitative information that we hope to be able to produce from those samples. 29% um, were at or below 200% of the poverty level, uh, a guideline for which uh, program eligibility is often tagged. 54% are employed full-time in spouses, adults, friends, and neighbors. Those are the people that made up this sample of caregivers. <clears throat> this uh, diagram uh, helps to understand a little bit about the differences between the groupings of caregivers that served as primary caregivers and secondary caregivers. Um, not probably surprising to most of you, uh, on, among primary caregivers, uh, about a quarter were spouses, uh, over a third were daughters, 21% were sons, uh, which perhaps surprises folks a little bit, uh, a little a larger number than we expected, 12% were other relatives, and 7% were non-relatives. Um, among secondary caregivers, and those are defined as those that were providing support either to the individual through uh, some tasks, uh, that is the individual receiving care, or providing support to the caregiver. <clears throat> Oftentimes a secondary caregiver was a friend or relative uh, of the primary caregiver who was assisting them in some of the care. Um, one of the things that is both interesting and to me heartening uh, in these results is that among secondary caregivers, we see 39% non-relatives. That means that we have a potential source uh, of strength uh, and uh, uh, task uh, uh, abilities among that group of individuals who are friends and neighbors, but not necessarily related to the individuals who are providing care. Uh, among secondary caregivers, we also have 28% daughters, 14% sons, and 17% other relatives. So again, a larger proportion of other relatives and non-relatives, in fact, those two group make up over half of those that identified as secondary caregivers. I think something to keep in mind as we go forward looking for possible ways of strengthening informal networks. Uh, about one out of five caregivers said that um, it was a relatively planned activity that they became a caregiver. Uh, and this, this comment is typical. My sister and I provide the support to my mother jointly we met as a family and talked about how we were going to deal with the challenges. And I've heard other caregivers speak that way. Um, so we found that uh, in our sample, 62% said the expectation of 
becoming a caregiver fell uh, almost exclusively on them. Uh, and this comment was uh, typical. My father remarried after my mom died. His second wife died in March of 2010. At that point, my dad decided that he wanted me to become his primary caregiver. Um, wanted me. Dad decided that he wanted me. So uh, many of you, and you know who you are, have been selected uh, by a force of will that is well beyond your own powers to control. 86% um, of those that we interviewed uh, uh, among the primary caregivers had spent at least a year in their role as a caregiver. 30% had spent 10 years or more. The average time providing care, primary caregivers 37 hours per week, secondary caregivers 9 hours per week. Um, 40%, however, said that they share the home with the older adult they care for. Most of those were spouses, but there were also some sons and daughters, and frankly, a surprising number of sons who were sharing their home with their parent that they were caring for. So these are the tasks. Um, just have you look down the left-hand side there to look at, and these are grouped uh, according, from top to bottom according to the most frequent tasks. The brown lines represent the primary caregivers, and the gray lines represent the secondary caregivers. But you can see that companionship, essentially being present with the person, is the number one activity. Um, along with shopping, transportation, paperwork, and forms. And you see that the assistance by secondary caregivers drops off a little bit uh, more than it does with the other areas when it comes to doing paperwork and forms. So Medicare, dealing with the insurance company. Um, I'm a I'm a caregiver to a fellow who's 98 years old. He lives at the Masonic home. And um, I can tell you after selling his house and having an estate sale um, and selling a property for him in Florida, the paperwork can be daunting. Um, so uh, this, this work for primary caregivers can be one of the elements that really drives them nuts. Uh, housekeeping, preparing meals, managing finances, heavy chores, nursing, medical care, and personal care. These are the top categories uh, of types of assistance provided by caregivers. Um, we're going to focus now a little bit on support. Um, what is the most important resource that supports you as a caregiver? This is the frequency of responses that we saw. Support from family, friends, and neighbors, uh, the highest at 62%, followed by these other types of resources. Um, and we'll talk about each of these others because they each have an important place, even though they don't come high in the category of support for the caregivers themselves. So um, this is circle invention is one of Kristen's inventions. And it's really, I think, helpful to think about the ways in which uh, uh, individuals are surrounded by a support network. Now, some networks may be quite narrow. Um, it may be that one individual is uh, providing care to uh, a care recipient uh, spouses uh, uh, are sometimes alone in their caregiving responsibilities or have uh, only modest amounts of help. But outside of that circle, there may be uh, other informal supports from relatives or friends or neighbors or someone at church. There may be workplace support in the form of flexible hours or some other ways in which an employer is helpful and sometimes not helpful. Um, community support in the form of community organizations, resources, uh, uh, places where an individual go. And then there are also formal systems of services. Uh, and many of those that are here are associated with formal systems of services. So let's now just uh, take a little bit of time to focus on these uh, uh, resources, uh, such as the healthcare resources, home based services, and community based services. Um, this is an interesting uh, uh, bit of information for me about where caregivers turn for information. We looked at the proportion of families, uh, of, of caregivers that we interviewed, and the extent to which they turned to various sources. So again, initially, um, people turn to family, friends, and neighbors. Those are the people that they know. They ask questions of them. Um, however, there are, are lots of other places. One of the things about uh, uh, insurance providers is, of course, they are dependent on insurance providers for benefits. So it's natural that you would see people turn there. Um, I think the internet or website is one of uh, is, is a growing place, and I think the, the baby boomers, uh, as as we get older, we're going to see a huge amount of searching on internet resources. It means that our presence for resources related to caregiving are going to be critical there. Um, but also, you see high proportions uh, using newspapers, county or state social services, um, and a variety of others. I wanted to point out 
Uh, 18% had used the senior linkage line. Um, this, of course, is a network of connections in the state of Minnesota that provides opportunities for people with one call to access information about services. Um, I think there is a great opportunity that this is suggesting uh, in terms of increasing the awareness of that and having our caregiver resources better connected with that resource. Um, sources that were found most useful, we've now ranked that list according to uh, how people found the value of these services. Uh, some shift in order, but again, uh, probably not a lot of surprises. Uh, one of the things that I think is most important is that uh, people uh, that are in situations that are, that are crisis-like in their families often turn to the professionals that they have direct contact with for information. And so it's critical then if we are to be able to have good strength in our caregiver resources, that all of those professionals that are in a position to answer a person's question, whether they come to the doctor for a treatment or a diagnosis or any other type of routine service, that those individuals be keenly aware of the resource, resources for caregiving that are available. Um, we had 24 of our primary caregivers who had uh, transitioned the person that they care for into a long-term care facility. Um, differences in the caregiving role that we saw for those that were uh, caregiver to someone in long-term care, um, not surprising perhaps, but less time spent per week um, and help with fewer routine tasks because they're in a facility and they're getting additional help because of their presence in that facility. Um, however, what was interesting was that the distress, uh, as measured by um, uh, various items in our survey uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, stress or uh, feelings of depression, um, their distress was relatively on par with other caregivers. That is, simply moving a person to a residential facility does not necessarily reduce the feelings and the emotions and burdens associated with caregiving. 12% said that becoming the caregiver prevented placement. This is, among those individuals that were uh, uh, caring for someone at home, 12% of our sample said they, it was clear to them that had they not stepped in to do that, their only other alternative was admission to a facility. And I think, you know, the whole context of this conversation, and I know all of my friends who are planners at the state of Minnesota know this, uh, and are, are getting, trying to get everyone to attend to this, is that if we are not able to strengthen the ability of this network of family, friends, and relatives providing care to individuals in their home and keep that network strong and continue to find resources and supports that perhaps are not there now, it will be incredibly burdensome on our state coffers, our Social Security and Medicare, to provide the level of care that the current generation is receiving that uh, we already know what those Medicare and Social Security costs look like. And if we, are, if we do not become more successful at strengthening these informal networks, we will have uh, a much greater difficulty in just a few short years uh, when it comes to the resources that are going to be available in state and county government. Home-based services, uh, 117 primary caregivers of an older adult in the community and 54% of that group used uh, one or more home-based services. Um, again, and this is, I, I think, interesting, looking at the, trying to discern the caregiver profiles from this to see whether or not there were significant differences between the caregiver profiles of who was or was not using um, home-based services. We could not get that from the information. We couldn't see difference in the patterns based on the information from our survey. Now, granted, we don't have in this survey healthcare information on the care recipient. So we don't know diagnoses. We don't know the extent of ADL or IADL functioning. We don't know uh, all of the range of elements that are going on in the lives of that care recipient. So it's, we can't definitively say that those profiles are not different, but it, in terms of the caregiver profiles themselves, they were not significantly different. Um, caregivers in our sample had a really strong tie to the community. I showed you those neighborhoods in St. Paul where we did the sample. We do think that this is reasonably representative of caregivers in other communities as well. We don't think that this is an aberration. But on average, they were 20 years at their current residence, 84% recently engaged in community activities, and uh, they had a high degree of community connectedness as shown in these following items. 88% um, say, this feels like home to me. 83% uh, 
who said that they were willing to help uh, their neighbors. Uh, will, neighbors in their community were willing to help each other out. Uh, they trusted others to look out for them, and they felt connected to their neighbors. So again, these are really strong patterns and feelings to be able to build on if you're trying to strengthen the range of informal support networks. Finally, uh, uh, for my portion, and I'm going to turn it over to Kristen here, uh, workplace support, 54% of the caregivers in our sample were also employed. Almost a third of them were employed full time. Uh, employed caregivers said that support at work would often take the form of either flexible hours or formal pol policies like the Family Medical Leave Act or some type of employee assistance program. That's what the alphabet soup up there means. And then um, some form of emotional support, often from colleagues and friends. Three in 10 working caregivers reduced their hours due to their caregiving role. 15% said that they had cut back 10 hours or more. And five caregivers had stopped working or retired altogether to accommodate caregiving. So we know both from these stories and other stories that many caregivers have to adjust work life in order to respond to the needs that their care recipient represents.